I will make a start because I've got some introductory comments to make as well. So first of all, I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to this special meeting of the all party parliamentary group on the Green New Deal, which I'm chairing with Clive Lewis MP. And joining us this morning, we're delighted to have with us Ambroise Fayol, who is the Vice President of the European Investment Bank, whose areas of oversight include financing of environment, climate action, and the circular economy. Professor Mariana Matsukatu, Professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London, where she's the founding director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Heather McKay, Senior Policy Advisor at Sustainable Finance at E3G, the Independent European Climate Change Think Tank. And Adrienne Buller, Senior Research Fellow at the Think Tank Commonwealth, where her work focuses on the relationship between finance and the climate crisis. And thank you so much to uh, members of the public and the policy community who are also joining us and our fellow MPs and peers. Just before we get started and hear from our first expert, I just wanted to say a few words to set the context for this morning's discussion. We're here to, dis to, to explore how, if it is well designed, the investment criteria and the governance of the UK Infrastructure Bank could channel investments into projects that advance the UK's ability to properly address the climate emergency, to enhance and restore nature, and at the same time to support good green jobs where they're needed, right across the four nations of the UK, promoting social justice and greater equality at the same time. So that is the prize, and we urgently need to rise to that challenge. And in a sense, the infrastructure bank and how it's designed is a litmus test of our ability to do that. While it's critical though, of course, the bank is just one institution, it's one player among many. And that's why as well as focusing on the uh, infrastructure bank, we'll also be exploring wider changes that are needed in the criteria for and structure of green finance, if we really are to transform life in the UK, so that it is greener and fairer, at anything like the speed and scale that the science demands. And I think what the times call for and what we're still sadly lacking is bold, decisive action. In the UK, all too often, the government appears to believe that the climate can be dealt with as, a, as an add-on, an extra, a nice to have. I was at a meeting recently with the Minister Kemi Badendok. It was the Environmental Audit Committee and, and she literally said that green conditions on the super deduction tax break were, and I quote, regulation that's not necessary because it would, and I quote again, strangle our economic recovery. So they still don't get it because an economy that isn't a green recovery uh, isn't uh, sustainable and it's not even a recovery. So a climate and nature lens has to be applied to every single decision the new UK Infrastructure Bank makes and every single decision that the Treasury makes as well. So the 27 billion pounds that the Treasury has allocated for new roads, for which we now know no environmental impact assessment was ever made, urgently needs to be reallocated. We need to front load investment into areas like energy efficiency upgrades, which could have countless multipliers ranging from those good green jobs to breathing clean air and enjoying warmer homes. So it really feels like we're at a critical crossroads and that action we take now either locks us into decades more emissions, sealing the fate of communities here and around the globe, or it gives us the chance that we might just avert the worst of the climate emergency and create a fairer and greener society. And we don't need to look very far away to see how it could be done. In the US, President Biden's multi-part executive order signed at the beginning of the year, embedded addressing the climate emergency across every single part of government. There's a new Office of Domestic Climate Policy to coordinate action across government, a national climate task force comprising 21 government agency leaders, an environmental justice interagency council to address racial and ec economic inequities as well. And just last month, we heard the scale and ambition of Biden's plans for jobs, a $2.3 trillion plan to unify and mobilize the country to meet the great challenges of our time, in his words, creating more than 10 million jobs while targeting racial and social injustice. And we could be doing that kind of thing here, that kind of approach, the only thing that's missing, of course, is the political will. And that's why we're delighted to be joined today by four experts who can help us explore how we can act now to deliver a UK infrastructure bank that enables us to build back a fairer and greener Britain, and which will set out the wider changes needed to finance if we're to address the climate crisis, if we're to restore nature, and if we're to level up the nation. 
So I will pass over to our experts now. Each of them will present their thoughts in turn, and then we'll have questions from MPs and peers and from people joining us on the webinar. So please do um, put your questions in the Q&A chat. Uh, sorry, in the Q&A function, don't put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A function. Uh, and we will be operating up voting. So if there are questions that you want to give priority to and really try and make sure they get addressed, then do just upvote them uh, on that function. And now I am uh, co-chairing this meeting with Clive Lewis, and I would like to hand over to him to introduce our first expert. Thanks, Caroline. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so to begin with, we'd like to welcome Ambrose Fayol, uh, Vice President of the European Investment Bank, uh, whose areas of oversight include financing of environment, climate action and the circular economy. Uh, we're particularly grateful to the Vice President for joining us and are looking forward to exploring what lessons uh, we can apply from the experience of the uh, European Investment Bank to the UK Infrastructure Bank. Uh, over to you, Andrew. Thanks a lot and uh, many thanks for the, for the invitation. Um, good morning from, from Luxembourg. Um, I, I, I'm going to, uh, to, to tell you a bit about how we are transforming the, the European Investment Bank into uh, the, the European Union Bank for Climate, basically, and uh, also based on what we, we think, uh, uh, also a uh, point that, that you made earlier, uh, uh, that uh, the recovery needs to be uh, a green recovery. Um, the, 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 I mean, what I'm going to, to say is two things. One, uh, what we have decided to do and the combination of both quantitative and qualitative targets. And the second one is which kind of uh, lesson I think, I'm personally, uh, I think we, we have learned from, from, this, uh, from this, this journey. And actually this journey started in, uh, in 2019 with a revision of our energy lending policy. We have, the, we have decided to uh, stop basically financing uh, unabated fossil fuel. So uh, we, we are out of, uh, of, of gas projects to, to, make it, uh, to make it clear when the level of, uh, of emissions is, is above uh, 250 grams of CO2 per, per kilowatt hour. And then last year, we uh, have concentrated our efforts to present to our board a climate bank roadmap. That is the way to accompany with the, in the context of the, the, the European Green Deal, uh, the, the transformation of the European investment bank into a climate bank. And uh, for that, we have uh, both quantitative and qualitative targets. The, the, the quantitative targets are, we have this, we had a, 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 a minimum of 25% of our action to be dedicated to climate. Uh, by 2025, it has to be minimum 50%. So a doubling, a doubling on, on a base that, uh, that is big because we, we are basically lending uh, on average uh, 60 billion euros per year. So basically we have to be above 30 billion in 2025 where we were uh, minimum 15 billion uh, one year ago. Uh, so the, the shift is really big. Uh, and it has to imply everything we finance from renewable energy to energy efficiency to, uh, to innovation. There is also a target in terms of investment mobilized because what also is important is that not only we finance, but we bring investors to finance projects with us um, and, and crowding in basically. And, and the qualitative target is more uh, in terms of we've decided to say as of January 1st, 2021, all our projects will be Paris aligned. And the idea behind that is it is good to, um, to increase significantly the amount uh, that, that we have to finance for green projects at the minimum, but we are not going to finance only green projects. And uh, we are going to be uh, active uh, still in the health sector, for example. Uh, and for this, these projects, what we need to be sure is that they are Paris aligned and that uh, they, are, uh, they are not basically going to be uh, on the opposite side of, of moving to the climate bank. And for that, what we have decided to, uh, to do is to, to, to increase significantly, I mean, in, in the internal calculation that we have for calculating the, 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 the profitability of, uh, of our projects, we use to have a profitability that is based not only on financial terms, but also environmental and social. 
And what we have decided to do is we use a, a, a shadow carbon price. We are going to increase that significantly. Uh, we, we were at 30, uh, 30 euros per ton uh, last year. We are now at 80. The target will be 200, uh, 250 by 2030 and 800 euros per ton uh, by 2050. And the object, the, this has been set to, uh, to be consistent with the objective of uh, being climate neutral by, by 20, 2050, as is the, the European uh, Union objective. And that means that there are projects that, uh, that we will uh, continue to finance, and there are projects that we will not finance anymore. And if I can give one example of each, this means that we have not followed, actually, the, there was a big consultation with, uh, with external stakeholders. And some of them told us, well, you have to stop financing roads. And we came to the conclusion that this, this, this was not the general answer that we could give. Uh, and that it has to be based on, the, on, the, on the, the, uh, this evaluation of, uh, of, of project based on the carbon price, and also based on the evolution we think will happen in terms of the number of electric cars that are going to, uh, to be on roads. Uh, and so we will continue to do some uh, projects in, the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in roads. But we will stop financing new airports, for example. Uh, we will stop that because we think that uh, when you say the number of electric cars is going to increase significantly, in the next year we don't see that uh, happening for uh, for for uh, airports. So we we will continue to finance, for example, renovation of airports, or when there are projects to uh, to find against adaptation uh, of, of in favor of adaptation, uh, for example, in some overseas territory there are. Uh, more and more uh, cyclones that are more and more violent, then we can finance projects that can, that can help uh, uh, airports for that, but we will not finance new, new airports. Um, so that is basically the, the, the thing that, that we are implementing with uh, a lot of things that, that are down the road for us. And uh, for 2021, we have a number of projects that we need to, uh, to work on, that we are working on actually. For example, what means the, private, the, the, the Paris alignment for, for our counterparts? It's something to do that for projects, but we need also to check how we can do that for our counterparts, be it uh, high emitting or not. Uh, and there is, of course, a difference if, uh, between the, the two categories. Uh, so I, I, I'm not going to be, uh, to, be, to be long on this because I think I, I would very much like to, uh, to also hear, uh, hear other, um, other uh, uh, other participants. Uh, but let me just say in, in conclusion uh, where, what, what, how we have moved. Uh, the Climate Bank roadmap, to the surprise of many, has been adopted at the first round of uh, discussion by our board and at the unanimity, meaning all geographies in Europe have been supporting this, uh, this, 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 uh, this big transformation. And I think uh, the reasons were probably first a lot of uh, consultation. Uh, we have decided that we would present a lot of uh, reviews of what we have proposed. So we said nothing is set in stone. We are going to review, for example, the shadow price of carbon. We'll review it uh, every year. Uh, there are many uh, things in the Climate Bank Roadmap that is uh, set for the next five years that are going to be reviewed also um, midterm or uh, I mean, so that we can see if what we have uh, embarked on is, is good or is, uh, is too little, is too much, uh, so that we can, uh, we can really uh, try to adjust when needed. What was also extremely important is to, uh, to, to link that to what we call the just transition. That uh, there are geographies in Europe that, are more, that have more to do to get to the, to the climate mentality. Those geographies, we need to help them more. More financially, more in, in advice, uh, more in assistance for them to set up the appropriate policies uh, because it is, of course, for some geographies, the, the, the steps are bigger. 
So, uh, and, and, and frankly speaking, I think this was key for the support uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in geographies and also within countries. Huh? This is the same thing uh, for, for being sure that no one is left behind. Um, and actually what I can, uh, what I can see is, uh, interestingly, the, this is a big motivation for our staff. So you see that in the discussions with the staff, the fact that we are embarking on this new road has been really something that has been considered as a key driver for their motivation to work at the, at the European Investment Bank. And I think that is, that is, uh, that is really something that, uh, that I would, uh, that I would uh, stress. And a final point, I think it is important to commit to targets. Uh, the, this gets the process in motion of all parts in the institution. So uh, we did that at the bank. We had already targets. Uh, if if uh, I think of your uh, your next uh, your next uh, infra bank, I think uh, that that is probably uh, very important. That's probably easier also because you come from something where you don't have already uh, teams, targets, etc. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ambrose. Appreciate that. Um, it's very thorough uh, in the time that we have. Um, can I open up to questions and to the panel, uh, if possible? And obviously, I'm going to abuse my position as a co-chair and, and ask the first question, uh, as is traditional. Um, can I just ask you something about the uh, stakeholder and governance, the stakeholder participation in the bank? I, I, one of the things I'm really concerned about is that there's uh, kind of a democratic accountability and transparency in the decision making, because this is really it's critical decision making that we're talking about here on the future of the climate and so on. Um, is there anything we can learn from how you've structured that uh, in the EIB? Okay, how we have structured that is um, uh, first in the process to move to the to the to the before the discussion at the at, at the at the board, we had a very long consultation with stakeholders. So uh, and and openly uh, that was uh, we received a lot of comments. Uh, and and could, that could be shared with uh, so that's uh, that and actually uh, by the stakeholders it's it's not only NGOs it's so it's also uh, all people who, who who have an interest in the in in the, in the issue uh, and and actually we try to uh, we try to keep this uh, every year with uh, with our external stakeholders that uh, that we can discuss with them. Uh, either on specific uh, specific projects that we have, uh, uh, for example, this year we'll have uh, an external consultation on the revision of our transport policy, because the, you know the, the beauty of the climate uh, climate bank roadmap is you have to review and Paris alignment you have to review all your policies, uh, and uh, so that will be the case for the transport policy this year, for example. Uh, and, and we do that uh, on, on a regular basis. I think the, so the fact that it is uh, set in, in, in regular basis is, uh, is, is very good. I think what brings also confidence is that uh, you need to have transparency um, throughout your activities. And, um, and, and for that, uh, for, I, let me give you a few examples. Uh, we have been the first to issue green bonds. And we are still a big issue of green bonds. Uh, the use of proceeds of our green bonds are audited. Our annual climate and uh, environment finance is audited. Uh, the reporting of our uh, carbon footprint uh, is also audited. So uh, that is something that brings confidence because it is also a bit beyond standard practice. And, and I think it's important to, uh, to, to report uh, and to be held accountable on, on, on our commitments. And actually, the same way we are working on that, uh, uh, we have committed to, uh, to disclosing our exposure to climate risks. Uh, so as soon as our piloting phase is completed, we will do that uh, through the, the, the TCFD compliant uh, reporting. Thank you, Ambrose. I have other questions on this issue, but I'm not going to abuse it that badly. So I'm, I'm going to open it up to the rest of I can see Vera um, has a question. Vera. Thank you, um, and thank you for outlining how the European Business, business Bank operates. What worries us in the UK um, is, is sort of that we are running out of time, uh, and I, I would really like to understand a little bit 
about the, the time structure, how long it actually took to put everything in place that you have just explained. Um, and, and, and now that here in the UK, we are going to have this infrastructure bank, um, but things have to happen very quickly. Um, and what should be for, first of all, um, how much time do you think um, uh, we need to put everything in place, but also what should be at the very beginning in order to make sure um, that the, the bank operates directly to, towards um, our sustainable targets? I, it, it is a difficult question. Uh, it is a difficult question. Uh, what, what I could say is, um, first, um, I mean, in our case, we did decided to do that by stages. So we started with the revision of the energy lending policy as a first step of moving the bank in transforming itself to the, to the climate bank. And then we moved to the other part, which is, uh, you know, the quantitative and qualitative targets. For that, all it took two years. Uh, two years for the energy lending policy, setting the right targets. Uh, one year for the climate bank roadmap. Now, you can also put, set, uh, put that in place and have things that, I mean, you don't need to have everything in place for starting. And actually, we are still working on adjustments. Uh, on how, for example, we are going to apply uh, the Paris alignment for uh, our intermediated financing, for the, the loans we do for banks who, loan to, to lend, who lend to SMEs. Uh, there, are, there are many things on which we need to work on. We are going to present this year a new adaptation plan, plan for adaptation, uh, an issue that is key for, uh, for in perspective of, 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 of Glasgow. Uh, I mean, on, on all this, uh, we have decided that it was key to, to try to, uh, to have the framework, to have an agenda of what you want to do when, but not necessarily to have everything ready before you, before you start uh, implementing the, the climate bank. And I think this probably, to some extent, uh, uh, maybe more to some extent, uh, starting from, uh, from creating a new infrastructure bank, uh, probably would make that a bit uh, a bit easier. Thank you, uh, Caroline. Thank you, uh, Clive, and thank you so much to uh, the vice president. Yeah, just just two things. Um, I just wanted to, if you had any reflections on the scale of the capitalization needed in order for an infrastructure bank to be able to front load investments in green infrastructure at the kind of scale and speed that we need. And then just another smaller question on something you said about, about building roads. I wondered if you are screening projects, not just from the climate and carbon perspective, but from any kind of broader nature perspective, because I guess we would argue, or some of us would argue at least that, um, yes, we would prefer electric vehicles to, to petrol vehicles or diesel, but we'd actually like to reduce the total number of vehicles on the roads as well. And maybe if there was more of a nature screening as well as the carbon screening, that could that could yield more of the kind of evidence on that side? Uh, on, on your first question, I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot really, um, really, really, uh, really say because it, it depends very much on, uh, on, on the, the, the kind of infrastructure also and the choice you make in, uh, in your priorities. Uh, for us, it, uh, I mean, it is, uh, it, it's also a combination of uh, what you can have uh, as for example, in our case, uh, a lot of financing that we have comes through blending uh, with resources from other sources. Uh, then the impact on the capital uh, and capital need is, is completely different. So uh, um, it's, I, I cannot answer that uh, that question uh, completely uh, without without uh, having the, the knowledge of, uh, of 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 that uh, that for the for the UK infra bank. Uh, on uh, nature, well, nature is, uh, is uh, and biodiversity is absolutely uh, essential. Actually, what we do is, uh, this is part of our due diligence. Uh, so when we look at a project, we look also at the consequence it has on, uh, on, on bio, uh, biodiversity and nature. And, uh, and, and this is included in the assessment that we, that we, that we do for, uh, for the project. We also do that, we also include that in our risk assessment. Huh? So, and I think it is uh, it is important to uh, to include that, and probably 
after uh, after this uh, this year and uh, you know the, the the objective of Kunmin and uh, uh, things that will be uh, showing the importance of biodiversity. We had also uh, uh, many uh, many events uh, early in the year on uh, uh, on 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 this. I think. Uh, uh, to include that in, in the way you assess projects is going to be more and more important. I completely agree with you. Are there any other questions from the panel? I, I, I know we've only got a few more minutes, so I'll, I'll ask the final question, um, if that's okay, Amber. If, 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 you're, if, if uh, our government had the foresight to, to ask you to come and be a consultant uh, for our own in, uh, uh, reinvestment bank, what would you, if you could do three things differently or three pitfalls that you could identify or three things that have to happen what would you you say they were what would you perhaps advise the uk government in setting up its uh, its own investment bank your top three or three potential pitfalls however you want to to advise <laughs> uh, well this <laughs> this is uh... Um, I mean, first, let me say that, uh, of course, uh, I mean, we uh, we have uh, we are we are completely uh, open and would be uh, would be delighted if there is uh, if there is a willingness uh, and uh, to to, uh, uh, to share views and to uh, and to help as much as 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 as, uh, as the, the UK authorities feel needed to, uh, to set up the the the, the new infra bank. Uh, what what I think is uh, is is important, um, and I mean it's it's the balance between ambition, feasibility, and acceptability. That is where you need to uh, you need to uh, you know uh, it's 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 a question of uh, and 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 there I I hope we have found the, the right balance. I I don't know, uh, but but you know if you are too. Uh, too ambitious to some extent. It's very good because you are going to uh, to finance very pure projects, etc. But at the same time, you are not going to help bring the transition and and bring as many people as possible. So you need to explain also very good to uh, to the to the public opinion, to the um, also to discuss that with uh, with politicians. Uh, how we can bring um, everything. Uh, in the direction that is good for everybody, uh, and and the question of social acceptability is the one that that we try to work uh, to work, but we probably could do more on that on that point. And uh, uh, the other thing that uh, that that we we try to uh, to, uh, to 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 do that, uh, and maybe we could have done that better, uh, is that it is really a comprehensive approach. Uh, you need to put that. That's what we have told our uh, our, our board. That's what we have told our uh, our clients as well. We need to put climate in everything we do. That means not only uh, in in our renewable energy projects, of course, but also when we finance uh, new uh, new schools, and we do that all over Europe. We ask systematically that a good part of that. Is, has to be um, energy efficiency. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, that we are financing the the green projects for the future. You know, research and development. I mean, we know that if we want to reach the target of climate neutrality by 2050, it will be based on innovations that we are even not aware today what they are going to be, but they will come. And you need to finance them, and that is extremely important. But for a bank, I can tell you, this is also very costly because this is risky. Uh, but this is the kind of risk that you need to take, and you need to uh, have everybody uh, on board in terms of uh, uh, yes, this is the right thing to do to uh, to be in the hydrogen, to be in the in the batteries, uh, even in raw material. You know, all these kind of things that will at the end uh, allow to uh, to have the prospect of reaching climate. Uh, Ambrose, uh, thank you very much uh, for your contribution, uh, your insights, and your time as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and Caroline, over to you for our, our next uh, guest. Yes, my thanks as well. I appreciate you. You may need to leave quite soon, but thank you so much for spending time with us uh, this morning.
So next we'd uh, like to, to welcome Professor Mariana Matsukatu, someone uniquely placed to reflect on both how best to develop an ambitious policy framework capable of meeting the interlinked challenges of the climate, nature and inequality crises. And also having advised, I think the Scottish government on their infrastructure bank, also an expert in how a well-crafted infrastructure bank can play a key role in that endeavor. And just to remind people who are joining late, Mariana is professor in the economics of innovation and public value at UCL, where she's the founding director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And she's also the author of a recent book, Mission Economy, a moonshot guide to changing capitalism. So Mariana, you're hugely welcome. Thank you. And thanks to the whole panel for having invited me. Um, so just a bit of background because um, I, I really enjoyed the vice president's um, uh, points and, and maybe just some context in terms of the UK. You know, we have plenty of finance in the UK. There's no lack of finance. The problem is the type of finance. So it's really important, I think, always to begin with the obvious point, but it's good to make it, which is that finance isn't neutral. When finance is too impatient, too um, much about also just moving around existing assets and making money from that versus creating kind of new structures, expanding productive capacity, that's where we end up with problems. So in the UK, my colleague Josh Ryan Collins found that something like 80% of finance just goes back into the financial sector itself, broadly defined. So finance, insurance, and real estate. Uh, my own work has found that other forms of finance, for example, even venture capital, it's often badly structured. Why? Because it's too exit driven. It's rushing change to happen simply because there's a desire for an exit through an IPO or a buyout. So for example, in the biotechnology sector, that rushing of the scientific process has caused lots of problems. It didn't actually allow in some ways biotech to fulfill the promise that everyone hoped it would. And we've ended up with a lot of plepos, productless IPOs. Uh, second is that patient long-term finance, which is what we're talking about when we talk about public banks or infrastructure banks, is not only what is needed, but it has historically proved to be incredibly important when we have transitions, when we actually want to transform an economy. So if we're happy, with the state of the economy, then maybe we don't need such a bank. If we instead want to, for example, change the form of growth away from pure private debt driven consumption form of growth, which we have in the UK towards an investment led growth. If we want that investment to be directed towards green transitions and so on, that's why a bank of this sort is critical. And that's very important to say, because we need to start with actually looking at, you know, what is the state of play in the economy. So, you know, the IT revolution, I've already mentioned the biotech revolution, the space revolution, they all require different forms of patient finance. And we today are talking about a particular form through an infrastructure slash public bank. But, you know, that's also a really important point. We don't get transitions without patient finance. Now, kind of going deep into this particular type of bank, there's different criteria that I think are really, really important. And I'll be focusing mostly on uh, the bit that I've been sort of obsessing about for the last 10 years, which is that they really need to be challenge oriented. They shouldn't just be handout machines. That doesn't get you transformation. It doesn't get you additionality. What do I mean by additionality? I mean, actually helping things happen that wouldn't have happened anyway, right? I mean, that's a good principle for any sort of public policy. But the first kind of basic point is that it definitely needs to be well capitalized. Um, and the treasury has said that it will capitalize the UK infra infrastructure bank with 5 billion pounds of initial capital. And then the bank is gonna be able to borrow up to 7 billion from a government credit facility or by issuing bonds in private markets. And it will also be able to issue up to 10 billion of guarantees. And all of this should sum up to uh, what they call a financial firepower of about 22 billion pounds. Now it's really important to step back and say, this is 1% of UK GDP. It's you know, better than nothing, of course, but comparing it, and we should be comparing it to other forms of public banks and learning what works, what doesn't, it's important to note that you know, this is much, much less, for example, than the German public bank, the Italian public bank, and many others even in the developing world. So the KFW, the public bank in Germany, um, has a balance sheet of about 500 billion, which is more than 15% of German GDP. Casa Depositi e Prestiti, I say that as an Italian because I am an Italian. Um, its balance sheet is about 500 billion also, which is about 20% of Italy's GDP. Um, so 200 billion really is what I think we would need in the UK, uh, which would bring it to about 10% 
of uh, UK GDP, which is still less than those examples I just gave. Second, it has to be long run focused. And by that, I mean, not only the projects that we're going after should be really kind of ambitious and long run, but the bank needs to be able to roll over the funding year to year. This is a problem we had with the Scottish bank where the treasury initially wasn't going to allow that. And that by definition doesn't allow you to do that long run planning. C, I or three, sorry. Uh, I think we really need to focus on direct investments when possible and not having to go through the private sector through different types of guarantees. That's the whole point. The point is to be ambitious with direct public investments, which then can crowd in private investment. That in fact is a measure of how successful you are. Have you actually been able with each pound of you know, government uh, uh, public bank money, been able to crowd in other forms of, of private finance? And that's often the case when you are increasing what Keynes called the animal spirits of the private sector, increasing the expectations of future opportunities in different, for example, green, nature-based, you know, future of mobility areas that bring us towards sustainable growth. If those opportunities don't currently exist, that should be really the ambition of such a bank in order to be catalytic. And lastly, this idea of being mission-oriented, not just handing out money, is really key. First of all, this is really catching on globally. I was very happy that the European Commission took it on on the back of two reports that I wrote for them. And the idea really is you don't pick sectors. Such a bank shouldn't say, you know, even with renewable energy, don't focus on the sector, focus on the problems like, you know, the future of mobility, carbon neutrality in a specific region and get all sorts of different sectors to become, you know, part of the solution. So picking the willing, not picking winners. Um, and the other thing is, you know, there should actually be conditions attached. It shouldn't just be free money, even these, in these ambitious areas. There should be proof that it will actually cause transformation. And a quick example that can give on that is when the KFW, again, the German bank, was asked to help the steel sector, which, you know, also in the UK and other countries is having problems and asking for public loans or bailouts. They were quite ambitious precisely because they had a, you know, the energy van mission that the loan provided from the public bank was conditional on the steel sector reducing its material content. And they did that throughout the whole value chain. They weren't micromanaged, they did it on their own. You know, you can't micromanage the process. They did it through repurpose, reuse, recycle technologies across the whole value chain to the point that today Germany has one of the greenest, most sustainable steel productions in the world. And that, that kind of conditionality and making sure that these banks are really, again, catalytic, creating change that wouldn't have happened and change that is societally relevant to help transforming an, e an economy, definitely in this case towards a sustainable uh, path, I think is absolutely central, but it needs to be designed into the loans themselves. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much. That was, uh, there was so much packed in, in, in there. And um, if I can follow Clive's uh, wicked precedent of, uh, of, of putting the first question as, as, as chair, but just, I just wanted to probe a bit more on that, on that idea of picking the, the willing rather than the, the, the winners and, and, and how you then have in a sense a slightly more holistic approach rather than going sector by sector. And I just wonder if you could say anything more about what that means in terms of the, the remit of the bank to include social infrastructure, for example, does that need to be explicitly in there? And if so, how would we do that? Sure, I mean, first of all, you know, even though it's, it's, it's going to be quite normal, I think, for such a bank to be mainly providing loans to the private sector, I think we should just call it organizations, you know, pick the willing organizations, whether they're in the private, other forms of public, nonprofits, and so on, that are willing to move, you know, towards a transition. So if, for example, we start with one of the challenges, um, which I think we should start, by the way, that the UK government under Theresa May set itself with the industrial strategy back in 2017, which was in fact challenge oriented. I worked very closely with Greg Clark's team on that to make sure it wasn't just a list of sectors. The old sectors were, you'll recall, aeronautics, automotive, life sciences, financial sectors, and the creative industry. The question is to do what, <laughs> right? So in the back of some work we did, they chose these four areas of clean growth, uh, future of mobility, healthy aging, and the opportunities of AI and data for really you know, areas even in the welfare state, health services, and so on. And so transforming any one of those challenges like you know, the future of mobility into a concrete mission, which uh, was some work that we did included, for example, making sure that, that transport was 100% accessible by everyone, that would include you know, innovations to crowd in bottom up that would be in areas of disabilities, right? And that would include both social, organizational, and technological changes in areas regarding disability. So I don't think it's about you know, micromanaging what it is you're actually trying to 
you know, a crowd in bottom up, that really does have to be left open and it will require lots of social innovation and social infrastructure. But the key thing is to be very clear on what the outcome is. So that will be part of what you then use to measure whether the bank has been successful or not. Has it just ended up giving out a lot of money to, you know, well-meaning uh, companies or sectors that, you know, look great on paper or has it actually been catalytic? And so making sure that we frame these missions to be broad enough that do bring in many different sectors, but also different actors in the public, private, third sector space. And that are you know, ambitious, like including something as, as clear as 100% you know, accessible uh, infrastructure that you know, creating also accident-free zones and so on, having you know, specific goals, but being open on the how and making sure that we do focus quite a bit on the social as well as the you know, organizational and technological changes that need. Thank you so much. Any questions from our from our panel? If not, I'll go to the to the audience. Uh, Vera. So, so when I hear all of that, a lot of it seems to be ultimately still dependent. You know, the, the, the um, example you used from from Germany on on a political will and political leadership. Um, how can one make a bank like this independent from the politics of the day? Um, that it survives um, through political changes um, and, 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 and continues in a, in a very undiluted way towards um, the target set it has set itself? I think there's, you know, it, it's a very important question. And I think there's two points there. One is an organizational question. How can we make sure that these organizations are public but not politicized so that every time you get a new minister or a new, you know, election, it all of a sudden, you know, start from scratch. And that's a huge problem in the UK, by the way. I've lived here 20 years and the name of the department, which is currently called Bayes, has changed, I think, four different times. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the name of the TSB then changed two or three times. And Bayes will probably change again because the word industrial strategy is no longer a word that the government feels comfortable with. They've you know, said that, which is strange actually, because they do have an industrial strategy. There is an innovation strategy, but this lack of confidence of what government is for is, is something that I think really needs to change in the UK, you know, uh, have more stability if you want, but also in terms of the bank itself, making sure that is, it is, you know, uh, independently governed also public, you know, fulfilling public goals, but having a good governance structure of the type that the vice president of the EIB was talking about. We in fact just wrote a report, I'm not sure if the vice president knows, for the EIB through my Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose on what does it actually mean to create a climate bank? What does it mean for its governance structure? What kind of expertise does it require? What does it mean for the portfolio and the risk reward you know, uh, relationship and so on? So all these questions are key. Um, but the second you know, part of your, of your question, I think is really about that higher level vision. You know, the first thing is, do we even have missions? <laughs> uh, do we have challenges? Is that part of the national debate? So yes, Brexit's happened, you know, and we can all have our opinions of whether that was good or bad, but so much of the national debate has just been on that. Uh, we have had a lot of discussion, obviously, like every country has now on COVID, but raising, you know, one's eyes over the horizon and remembering, first of all, that the UK is one of many countries that has signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals. That's a promise. When you sign up to, you know, a goal and put your name down as we will by 2030 fulfill these 17 incredibly or try 17 incredibly ambitious goals, 169 targets beneath them, that's not gonna happen without a, a debate about it, without also nesting those goals in cities and regions in localities. I'm co-chairing the Camden Renewal Commission with Georgia Gould, and we've thought about missions, for example, at the council level in Camden, outside my window here, um, which include things like you know, carbon neutrality within the housing estates and getting citizen assemblies and housing residents to the table to actually be co-creating and co-designing those missions or with all the youth crime that we've been experiencing recently in London, what does it mean to really make youth centers the best that the 21st century can offer? You know, think of the knowledge quarter that Camden sits in, you know, the, the Crick Center, the Wellcome Trust, British Library, British Museum, University College London. This is on the side of some of the poorest, you know, um, uh, 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 well, a very, you know, a borough that is afflicted, like, globally, the rich and the poor living side by side, and so many people not having the opportunities today to be able to benefit from, you know, digital technology, technological change, and so on. So what does it mean to, again, nest missions in concrete places like youth centers, 
housing estates, but always with really ambitious goals that bring lots of different sectors together. If one doesn't have leadership around that, both nationally, regionally, city level, at the council level, it's very hard then to even know where to begin. And that's when you risk setting up a whole bank like this, but it literally just becoming a handout machine to random lists of sectors, random lists of technologies, or even, dare I say, random lists of firms. All this talk about SMEs, small medium enterprises. Of course, it's important to help SMEs, but to do what? <laughs> to scale up, not just to start up, and scale up doing what? On this government demand side policies his, you know, in history have been very important. So having really clear goals, again, around you know, a carbon neutral city agenda can in fact be used to help startups you know, uh, come up with really interesting services for that. That's why Denmark, a tiny country today, actually is the number one provider of high tech digital, digital green services to China, which is spending over $2 trillion uh, uh, dollars on greening its entire economy, including you know, those old sectors like steel that I mentioned. And that has been very much on the back of kind of city level missions around Copenhagen to make it a you know, green city. Sweden is quite interesting on this because they've also thought about, you know, in terms of nesting it within concrete goals, things like school meals. Imagine if school meals were healthy, tasty, and sustainable. You know, and, and, and the importance of school meals, we all know how important it is, especially now we've had a, a football player in Manchester reminding the government how important it is to have free school meals during lockdown when it really is the only meal that many uh, kids have that's healthy. What does it mean to actually use it as a lever for innovation? So procuring school meals that are sustainable, that increases your you know, sustainability budget, your innovation budget. So making the everyday transformational is yeah. important and that requires patient long-term finance and that's where such a bank has to interact with vision ambition and leadership and when you you don't have that it's a wasted opportunity mariana that's fantastic i want to try and squeeze in two questions in in two minutes and they are massive questions so i really apologize for this but you can just begin to give us some headlines the first question is from the chat about GDP growth. So the first question that's got loads of people upvoting it is about the overall economic system. And when you've got an economic system based on an obsession with GDP growth, then, then in a sense, you know, how can we use this, this kind of moonshot approach to take us to an economy beyond growth? And then the second question was about um, the role of green QE and some of the work that, for example, uh, Professor Richard Murph has been doing on, on green QE and whether that is a, is, is a source of, of finance that could help us make the transi transition more, more quickly and fairly. I appreciate both of those are PhD subjects and more, and I'm giving you about two minutes, so head yeah. off. So I think it's, it's a really important question, but we should be careful because First of all, GDP, as imperfect as it is, and I wrote a whole book <laughs> you know, saying why it's imperfect, uh, well, the value of everything, um, it actually can tell us lots of things, but we're not reading into that, right? What I mentioned before, that, that the UK grows mainly through consumption, not investment, and that consumption is fueled by private debt to the point that the ratio of private debt to disposable income in the UK is back to the level it was before the financial crisis and that caused the financial crisis should be headline news. Does anyone talk about it? No, you can get that from traditional GDP figures. So let's not dismiss it completely. It doesn't help you direct an economy. And that's what we're talking about. We have to have a more inclusive and sustainable economy. And I don't believe in the no growth solution. I don't think that's gonna help us with all sorts of different issues around productivity, employment, and so on. We need a fundamentally different type of growth. A growth precisely that is about as I mentioned, you know, with the steel sector, repurpose, reuse, recycle, transformation of our sectors, new services like the Danish services that I mentioned, new digital green services to fuel a green sustainable transition. Those are jobs, those are skills, that is growth, but a fundamentally different type of growth from the one that we have. And I really personally find it a bit dismissive when it's just so easy to say, oh yeah, growth is the problem. So what's the solution? <laughs> you know, transforming that growth to really be you know, transformative like, you know, green digital services, like actually catalytic changes in the way we currently do mobility, <laughs> that, that will, you know, a, a result in growth, but fundamentally different, and it will be lower material intensive and lower carbon intensive, and that's what we need to be going for. I mean, the whole green QE issue, I think, you know, I, my time's probably up, but I think we need to remember that these are two different points. You need to create money, Yes, we can create money. Finance is created. Every time we go to war, we create money. 
but we tend to only do it when we go to war or when we have a massive crisis like we do now, but it's too late. <laughs> if you haven't been financing properly your health services, they will have a huge hard time during a health pandemic, right? So remembering that it's not right that we're just creating money you know, for these kind of emergency security, but actually what does it mean to always kind of interact you know, money creation with the ambitions and treat as seriously you know, our social goals as we tend to treat this, the technological ones. However, we need independence. You don't want you know, a central bank <laughs> to be the same thing as the public bank. However, you also don't want them to be completely separate. What happened with the financial crisis is we just filled the system with liquidity um, through central banks and so on. And most of that finance went back to the financial sector. So accompanying you know, money creation with uh, ambitious fiscal stimulus policies, with ambitious discussions, like the ones I just, you know, just uh, talked about before at the community, local, city, regional, national level on what's to be done and actually to you know, have types of stimuli like we see now in the US where Biden's jobs and infrastructure plan has very much of, of a green direction to that. That will then help land money when it's created in productive areas and green productive, sustainable productive areas. But you can't just create money without you know, sort of expanding the capacity of the economy and the capacity of the economy will expand when we have ambitious kind of targets of what are we actually trying to achieve. But you know, let's just remember coming to your previous point, what we're trying to achieve can also have really negative consequences unless it is framed in terms of a progressive agenda. And I always go back to the sustainable development goals. It took a long time for countries to come up with them. Let's start having a national conversation in the UK about what they mean and what they mean in local places and get citizens involved also in debating you know, uh, uh, how they want to live in the future. And Labour's voice, uh, the vice president talked about the just transition. It's so important. The global share that labor has of global income is at a record low. The profit share is at a record high. That means two things. One, the whole point of such an investment bank is not just to increase profits, <laughs> but to catalyze that reinvestment of profits into the economy and that crowding in effect that I mentioned before. But also labor's voice should be at the table, not just arguing for a just transition after the fact, but also ex ante. Labor's voice, the voices of students, you know, who are you know, Fridays for the Future, the BLM movement, the Me Too movement. I'm not just saying this in a, in a random kind of listy way, but social movements historically have made capitalism better. We have the weekend and the eight hour workday because of labor unions. There's something about saying this co-creation and co-design space of what's to be done really genuinely needs different voices. It can't just be the usual suspects on a Zoom screen. I'm gonna have to like stop this. you. That, that is just amazing, Marina. Thank you so much. And, um, uh, you won't have had time to read the chat, but there is so much appreciation there. And I just wanted to read out one thing someone put, the only person I've ever met who can make banking sound like an adventure. I think that's nice. So uh, thank you so much for your time with us uh, this morning and um, look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you. Back over to you, Clive. That was my line. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you use that. I can't believe you picked my question and my line, but that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the adventure continues now uh, with, and I'd like to welcome Heather McKay, who's a senior policy analyst at the European climate think tank E3G, who I've worked with before when I was uh, in Shadow Base. Um, and she's been pivotal uh, to their work on the UK Infrastructure Bank, uh, challenging the Treasury to go bolder and deeper in its capitalization remit and the governance. Heather, welcome. Thanks, Clive, and um, apologies in advance. Um, as you can tell from my accent and my name, uh, COP26 is not just a climate objective for me, it's also somewhat of a personal one being from Glasgow, which does mean that webinars can be a challenge. So I'll try and be as comprehensible as possible. Um, so great to follow on from you, Mariana. I agree with so many of your points, and I'll hopefully try to unpack a, little, a couple of things around the investment principles of the bank and how quite it should be integrating leveling up and net zero within its investment strategy. So um, as all of the panelists and attendees will well have surmised from the flurry of announcements coming out from the private sector and government on climate change, climate is now a mainstream issue. And this is particularly becoming the case for finance, a positive movement because finance is upstream of the real economy and it has to be encouraged to move first if we're going to stimulate the investment we need for the new infrastructure for the future. Climate's increasing role in financial decision making across public and private finance is important to drive capital away from ground investments towards the green investments we need to meet our national targets on climate and resilience. 
However, the investment challenge is steep. I think the CCC recommended that we need to scale up additional infrastructure investment from 10 billion a year in 2020, all the way up to 50 billion per year by 2030 and carrying that through to 2050. The scale of the problem is growing increasing every day that inaction happens. And we also, the UK can expect to see increasing costs associated with the physical impacts of climate change over this period too. Um, I know I'm going to pick up a point of Mariana here, but um, front loading finance for this is the most sensible way to deal with this. And the UK has set out its intention to deal with the challenge and become a global green finance leader with things like the, the PM's 10 point plan, which amounts to several kind of robust next steps on green finance, one of which being the green taxonomy and the other being the new National Infrastructure Bank. So um, I'm not going to speak at length to this, but public and financing institutions are really uniquely placed to deliver a broad range of impacts beyond the financial. And the bank's going to be the linchpin in delivering the government strategy on levelling up on net zero and resilience, so long as it's designed appropriately with appropriate governance and investment strategy and also monitoring and evaluation and transparency. Um, the bank basically needs to, to, needs to um, unlock private capital at scale for transition and make sure it's delivering capital to the right people the right projects and the right places um, to drive a green industrial revolution. So I'm not going to go through a comprehensive list of the principles. Actually, in E3G, we've been working quite extensively with Treasury and also with Bayes on designing the investment principles for the bank. Um, so I'll run through a few, and then I'm sure the questions we can unpack a few, a few more pieces. Um, firstly, the bank needs to be set up for the long term, um, with its net zero and levelling up goals enshrined in primary legislation with independent governance, reflecting the whole of the UK to ensure that it's, it's, um, these, these uh, objectives are manifested properly throughout the bank. So firstly, obviously, um, net zero needs to be at the heart of the bank's delivery of capital. If the bank's going to be transformational and delivering um, climate action, the spring framework needs to provide further detail on how exactly the bank's going to incorporate this into its investment, in its investment strategy. Secondly, the framework also needs to define what exactly levelling up is. I mean, that's you know, a term that I don't think a lot of us in the common discourse actually understand. So um, for us, in, from an E2G perspective, that's things like place-based delivery, an increased focus on social infrastructure and social impacts, including reducing inequality and increasing opportunities, and also a clear commitment to engaging with a range of stakeholders, including local authority, businesses, SMEs, and other funding bodies and public funding bodies in the UK to, to make sure that the bank work, leverages its impact through partnership. So levelling up and net zero shouldn't also be seen in opposition, because without green resilient infrastructure and good quality green jobs, we're never going to achieve levelling up across the whole of the UK that's sustainable. And balancing these objectives requires a couple of things. Um, I echo Mariana's point on the bank being mission driven. So as the bank evolves to new markets, it needs to have these, these objectives ingrained at its very core. Secondly, net zero should be used as an investment screen and minimum standards or do no significant harm principles should be embodied in the bank for the other objectives, setting out minimum thresholds for social and environmental impacts. And thirdly, an expert advisory committee that's independent and comprises a range of stakeholders can also help manage any trade-off decisions for, within the bank. Um, I think a final point on that um, on that objective is um, if this bank is set up in legislation that is independent and sufficiently capitalised, and the investment strategy is also uh, made clear to the market, um, it can send the right signal to the market that the government's long-term commitment to financing the transition and the direction of green finance, which will support the bank in unlocking capital scale. The second principle that the bank needs to incorporate is um, making sure it's additional and flexible. So additionality has two core elements, basically, one of which is it needs to avoid crowding out, which is should be simple, but the GIB somewhat was hit and miss with this, um, i.e. not investing where there are already existing markets and not crowding out private investment from existing opportunities. Um, the second piece is a bit more tricky, so the bank needs to encourage crowding in. So this isn't just about focusing on gaps in markets that exist, it's also about creating and working actively to create markets in the gaps. So again, echoing Mariana, it's not just about picking sectors, it's about taking a holistic approach to investment, which is flexible and reactive to the needs of the market. To achieve this, the bank needs to be forward looking and identify the investment opportunities of tomorrow. So markets where private investment currently can't understand where to make a profit. And the bank also needs to have a clear exit strategy when markets mature to ensure that it, it, um, it can reallocate capital to, to capital to those areas where it's most needed. So it's not just about delivering the capital and it being sufficiently capitalized, but it's also about being flexible and reactive. So in being flexible, this requires the bank to again, engage actively with stakeholders to understand their needs, offer a range of investment products to suit them, and also have the ability to aggregate projects, support innovation, and be an early stage investor 
things that the GIB was not able to do, and it sounds like the, the UK Infrastructure Bank will have the capacity to do, which is a really, really positive development. Um, another positive development is the bank also now having an advisory and project development function, which will help local authorities in understanding quite how to translate the needs of their citizens and their infrastructure um, into projects that the bank can help them fund. Um, the bank needs to be able to evolve over time and engage meaningfully through stakeholders as well to identify any market barriers. Um, without this positive feedback loop between the market, the bank and policy, the bank can't maximise its impact. There's another tricky point in here as well, which is around building trust. So if the bank builds trust and engages actively with stakeholders, it's going to build speed. If people feel and local authorities feel and businesses feel that they own the bank and supports their objectives and it helps them and provides them their value, the people will trust the institution and trickier projects are easier to push through. Um, having transparency on, on this also will really, really help and support that objective. Um, and the third and kind of final point I'm going to make is um, the bank really needs to take a future fit definition of infrastructure, which will eventually be aligned with the, with the taxonomy. So I'm sure questions are going to come out with the taxonomy because I have to say, even in the environmental space, the taxonomy is a tricky beast. Um, but it's effectively a classification system for what's green and what isn't. Two principles underpin this. Do no significant harm, which is the bare minimum. It doesn't mean you're green, it just means you're not doing harm. And also the second one is an active contribution to net zero and environmental targets. So mitigation and also adaptation. The investment strategy of the National Infrastructure Bank should align with this as soon as possible to make sure coherent signals are sent across the whole economy. And so this is something I know that EIB is, is, um, has set out its intention to do. And I would, I would encourage the UK to be another kind of world leading institution doing this. Because if we, if we do take a whole of economy approach to applying the green taxonomy, and basically sending out clear signals for what is green and what isn't, and using that to support transition, then it's a strong message to both private companies and public institutions that they too need to align and direct their capital accordingly, which will unlock capital at scale for the transition to transition to. In combination with using the green taxonomy and also taking a broad definition of infrastructure, which includes new projects like the built environment, energy efficiency, and also nature and nature-based solutions. The bank's bank can really be transformational. Um, I mean, I, I, again, I won't belabor this point because I know it's, it's come up a few times, but public financing institutions are really well placed to deliver a range of impacts with, I think, uh, said countless multipliers. Um, so the bank in its evaluation process should also make sure that it's a, it includes KPIs which reflect this, everything from financial outcomes to building resilience, to, climate, um, to uh, creating good quality green jobs skills. So um, I'll leave it there because I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions, but um, basically we're really excited at E3G and with the um, coalition of business, academia and um, trade unions and um, um, policymakers that we comprise um, on our infrastructure bank work because the spring framework is a real opportunity for the UK to set out um, its intentions for the bank to walk the top and to set up an institution which is green, fair and spreads the benefits of the transition across the whole of the UK. Um, and we really think that that, um, that it's not infeasible that this could happen. So thank you. And I hope that the accent wasn't too incomprehensible. Thank you, Heather. Uh, I know some people said they had some sound issues at the beginning, but I thought after for the, for the vast bulk of that, it was fine. So it may be individual connections that people are having issue with. Um, thank you for that presentation. Can I ask if anyone on the panel has a question? Um, anyone? I'll, I'll I'll kick off then. Um, can I just ask you? I mean, obviously you've been you've been lobbying the Treasury. Um, I imagine work. I don't know if you've been how close you've been working with them. But why has the Treasury got the capitalization of the bank so wrong? Uh, and what measures should they be using? And, and, and I guess my other question, if I can just kind of slot that in, is do they have the right attitude overall? Do you think to the investment bank? Caroline's opening remarks about some of the comments from. Uh, Kenny Badenoch, uh, work, work, whether they don't get it. Is that something you feel is kind of generally across the board on this issue? So, I mean, on the capitalization, um, so I guess it's about how you view it, really. Um, so, as compared to the Green Investment Bank, the bank is more um, uh, capitalized to a higher rate when it comes to paid in capital than the GIB. And it also has the ability to borrow, which is substantial. And they, they've indicated that the bank can grow in its capitalization through um, uh, revenue generation um, and so on and so forth. However, I completely agree with Mariana that it's insufficient for the scale of the challenge at hand. Um, the figures we've been 
spending with the figures that um, LSE and Aldersgate came up with the capitalizing it to, capitalizing it to the tune of 20 billion um, at the start. And so um, we just thoroughly recommend that Treasury makes a firm commitment um, to scaling up the capitalization over time, um, which I think will send the appropriate signal to the market. Um, in terms of their perspective on the bank, I actually think that there's been a, there's a great deal of improvement, um, again, from the GIB um, and signaling that, you know, this will have both levelling up and net zero as, as for objectives. However, objectives are not an issue. And so the, 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 in this investment strategy coming out in the spring framework, the Treasury really needs to commit um, to making sure that the, um, core, those core objectives are translated meaningfully into how the bank will operate this is going to be supported with things like setting up an independent advisory council to make sure that all decisions are um, uh, made in light with kind of best scientific guidance and so forth, aligning the bank with the green taxonomy um, as it comes out. Um, and also thirdly, um, making sure that the bank um, really considers a broad range of impacts as well in its evaluation process and translates those and communicates actively with stakeholders it works with to make sure that the feedback loop between um, the market stakeholders, the bank and government is um, active and, and productive um, to reduce barriers in the market. Um, and I think, the, the, I guess the, the other piece that I would probably add on as well, and Mariana brought it out as well, but I think it's so crucial to bring out, is the bank can't just look at the low hanging fruit today. It can't just look at the market failures for today. It needs to look forward five years, 10 years, 15 years to what technologies will be that we need to, to achieve our net zero and resilience goals. Um, and I think that's that's really crucial to making sure that the bank um, uh, can, can meet the needs continually of the UK. Um, and I have probably more to say on that, but I'll, I'll hold off for now for other questions. Thank you. I've got one here from Councillor Craghill, who asked what role zero carbon councils LEPs, that's local economic partnerships and combined authorities uh, while seeking investment could help do to shape the bank's criteria for investments? Um, so I think that's really, it's really important that the, the advisory council is um, made up of kind of a broad range of stakeholders and really you know, works actively with parliament, with, with parliamentarians, with um, stakeholders in the market and with kind of advisory councils like the, the ones you mentioned as well to make sure that it's accounting for um, you know the range of expertise we have at the moment. moment. I mean one, um, one core issue we see with the whole package of green finance developments at the moment and it's why we're pushing for this kind of whole economy approach to integrating the green taxonomy um, is that you know you, you need to make sure that coherent signals are being sent to the market. So you can't have one public finance inst financing institution saying one thing and another saying another thing and other policies um, pushing markets another way. You need to have a whole economy approach. And so um, I'd recommend that the bank needs to basically um, both map up, uh, map out um, uh, the range of public stakeholders it needs to be working with and also uh, make sure that it, it puts in place things like memorandums of understanding with institutions like the British Business Bank, um, and the Scottish National, Infrastructure, Scottish National Investment Bank um, to make sure that it's it's working cohesively with those bodies. Thank you. Uh, I've got one more question. I think you, it can probably be answered quite quickly. It's from Frank Sheridan. He says, as someone from a community that was and still is devastated by swift industrial change, uh, coal mining, uh, how can we ensure transformational and sustainable finance develops the swift change we need whilst also ensuring a just transition. So what could the bank do to ensure that? Are there any anything that we could hardwire into it to ensure that happens? Yeah, of course, there's a, there's a lot of options. Um, I think firstly, making sure that the bank um, sets minimum standards. Um, so in any project evaluation, yes, a net zero test is essential. Um, but also it needs, the bank really needs to actively consider the kind of broad range of impacts it's having from everything from job creation all the way through to skills development, other, other social infrastructure. And I think that, I mean, one thing that, that also will help protect against that is, um, is basically deep stakeholder engagement as well. It's making sure that the bank listens to the needs of different communities, because it's not a one size fits all um, a solution for any, any, any um, uh, council or, or local authority. Um, and especially because a lot of the financing with the bank will be front loaded for local authorities or infrastructure that both has climatic 
outcomes, but also social outcomes like transport, like the built environment, like energy efficiency, like nature, the bank really needs to make sure it's listening to those who have deep experience in these issues and in listening, engaging with citizens on these issues to ensure that it's accounting for all those perspectives. And I think the local authorities are incredibly well placed to act as advisors to the bank and as, insofar as the bank needs to support local authorities in, in understanding how to deliver finance, I think the bank also needs to listen to local authorities and make sure that they're really capturing um, the range of perspectives needed to, to ensure that, you know, um, situations like the, the, the um, question um, uh, um, has highlighted are, are eradicated from the impacts of the bank. Heather, thank you very much. Thank you for your time and your contribution. Uh, and I will now pass back to Caroline for our final guest. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Clive. And thanks, AGM, for being so patient, um, our last speaker today. But we're absolutely delighted to have our final expert, uh, Adrian Buller, Senior Research Fellow at Commonwealth. Over to you. Hi, thanks for having me. And sorry to everyone if you've just seen me sneezing in the background this entire time. I hope I don't sneeze my way through this. I made it through a pandemic just to be taken down by pollen, I guess. So <laughs> weak genetics. Um, so one thing that we've touched on a lot already is that there's a question surrounding the level of capitalization and ambition of the infrastructure bank. And a big part of this is because there is generally an assumption with banks like this and with similar projects that there'll be a crowding in of private investment. And that is one of the big goals. Um, this is the case for the EU Green Deal, where a lot of the promised capital is assumed private investment crowding in. Um, and, you know, Kristalina Georgieva, the managing director of the IMF, has uh, spoken a lot about the need to crowd in, you know, financial innovations in the private sector to finance, you know, biodiversity recovery. So this is quite a common theme um, around the world. And so in this context, people have looked to the booming success of what is called the ESG industry, which is environmental, social and governance investing in the private sector, um, and seen this as sort of a positive omen of things to come. Um, the industry has enjoyed record inflows of cash over the course of the pandemic. Um, and a lot of the you know, leading public bodies and politicians have been celebrating this as an indication that the assumption of crowding in private finance and private capital is one that will be realized and will enable us to sort of drive the transition. Um, but I unfortunately <laughs> think that there's a lot more to uh, the ESG situation than meets the eye. And I think there are really important lessons to be taken for how we define the mission of the NIB and our assumptions regarding um, crowding in private investment. So the first sort of major critique that's leveraged a lot um, is that there's quite a lot of greenwash and, and poor regulation of sort of sustainable finance and sustainable investing as it is. There are some sort of egregious examples. So in research that I've conducted, there are funds marketed as fossil fuel free that have invested in thermal coal companies or low carbon funds in the UK that hold major stakes in ExxonMobil. Um, and even where attempts to sort of rectify the situation have occurred, we've mentioned the EU taxonomy. Um, it's been a very fraught process, you know, years of negotiation and bargaining have still left the fate of natural gas, for example, uh, undetermined, um, you know, forest biomass uh, considered sustainable. And so, you know, there are a lot of struggles with actually defining what we consider to be green. And I think this would be an absolutely critical element for the NIB if we actually want to deliver the crowding in of green investment that is so often touted. But even where there aren't such sort of frankly embarrassing instances of greenwash, there are some more kind of fundamental questions to be asked about um, the nature of finance and exactly sort of what we're doing with, uh, with crowding and private investment. So, as, a, as another example, um, the top five holdings of Vanguard's US ESG fund, Vanguard is one of the world's largest asset managers. Um, it's what they market as their sustainable fund. And the five largest holdings are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. Uh, Tesla is sort of the first non-tech giant in the fund coming in at number six. Um, and you know, recent studies have found that the single biggest correlation socially for ESG funds um, is companies with almost no employees, because if you have few employees, you can't have labor disputes. And so these are the kind of bugs that are currently inbuilt to the way that we think about private finance and which we really need to resolve if we want to 
actually deliver the scale of investment that we so desperately need, particularly when this is the assumption that has in a large part underlied the sort of lack of capitalization of the public bodies and public investment themselves. Um, and the last point on that is that there's a very fundamental dynamic to consider here. And Mariana touched on this a lot, um, which is the idea of materiality and additionality. So when we talk about you know, the stock market, we tend to have this image of it being a source of investment for companies. But in reality, very little public, uh, sort of productive, sorry, investment is actually raised on stock markets. It's broadly, as Mariana mentioned, you know, money changing hands between investors who are speculating with very little impact on what companies actually do and on driving you know the change for example of a steel company from a high carbon intensive throughput to sort of lower carbon mechanisms so unless we change the way that we think about green investing as you know currently dominated by people betting on the likelihood of tesla and other giants making successes in the green transition then the concern for me is that not only will that achieve very little, but ultimately it could actually directly undermine the progress that we're talking about by sort of creating the veneer of, of progress in sort of sustainable investing and crowding in private finance, um, where there is actually nothing really happening to drive forward the transition. So as we look to designing what counts as sort of crowding in private capital to this space, it's really, really important that we consider, you know, the material impacts that are being driven, not just allowing sort of investors to bet on this transition. And and making sure that we're creating additionality. So actually driving changes uh, that wouldn't have happened otherwise and you know, focusing private investment not on stock market speculation, but on sort of patient, long-term, clearly defined sort of green bonds that direct finance at reasonable rates to low carbon initiatives within companies. Um, and also the last point is that while we are an island when it comes to the climate the UK is not an island, no country is. Um, and we have to recognize the need for uh, assisting in financing the transitions of countries around the world, particularly in the global south. And again, here, sustainable finance and the private sector has created a lot of problems because um, encouraging sort of unfettered private capital investment in emerging markets um, led to, at the start of the COVID crisis, an investor panic. And we had record outflows of investment from countries in the global south right at the moment that they needed it most, raising their capital costs you know, in a moment of desperation. And much like a pandemic, these kinds of shocks will be consistent and acute throughout the climate crisis. And so we need to think about a private financial system that doesn't sort of move with these whims that can end up not only harming the sort of mitigation and adaptation of those countries specifically, but also our entire sort of progress globally. Um, so I guess I'll conclude by just saying that as we think about the National Infrastructure Bank, I think we really need to consider fundamental questions about what we consider good finance um, and you know who should be delivering these and and to what end um, and so i'll just end there i think i'm well over time <laughs> you you that was perfect thank you so much and that's such an important um reality check really i think before we get all too carried away so thank you so much for that um i wanted to ask you the first question which was really about how much of the um the very real concerns that you've that you've raised can be addressed within the design and the structure of the bank itself and how much is to do with the wider policy environment i mean obviously lots of the things you've talked about the regulation of of what people put in their esg reports and so forth can't be addressed presumably by the bank itself but is there some, is there are there things we can do now with the design of the bank that could guard against some of the worst of what you've described as well as recognizing we also need to do quite a lot of other things too yeah, so I think that the bank is actually, you know, extremely important to addressing, um, you know, these rampant issues, even though, as you rightly point out, you know, its design is not the same as the regulation of green financial services. But because I expect, you know, the definition of a UK green taxonomy, as the Chancellor has set out his ambition for, even though I expect that to be you know, extremely fraught and complex and to last several years, we can make, um, you know, huge gains in the meantime with the design and the mandate of the uh, of the NIB. And, you know, that will come down to how it defines uh, its own, you know, definition of, of green activities, of what will actually sort of drive the transition. So not just saying, oh, you know, let's 
pile in a bit more money to winners like Tesla and you know major renewable firms, but actually looking at critical sectors like steel and cement, which we need to build, you know, the renewable infrastructures of the future, but which currently sort of lack the resources to do the decarbonizing that's necessary. So if it's able to focus on what actually will drive material change, it's creating things that wouldn't have already happened, and it's not sort of allowing greenwash as it were to happen, what that will do is give a very, very clear sort of signal to, um, as Heather sort of noted, clear, clear signals to markets about what is actually going to be um, part of this transition. And at least then, if there's sort of greenwashing happening at the sides, it can be a bit more self-contained, you know, that can be <laughs> speculators doing what they do best in speculating, but at least you'll still be delivering really clear, actually green investment. And I think it would have, you know, significant knock-on effects in the way that sort of private finance actually behaves if done right. Thanks so much. Uh, Clive, Jenny, anyone else uh, from our panel? Want to ask any questions? Um, well, um, we had a debate yesterday um, in the House of Lords on the, um, does Gupta economics of diversity? And as a green, I was a little bit torn about it because of course, um, the economics um, of biodiversity is something that we won't recognise at the same time. We don't want it um, exhausted and, and, and overused. And I just wondered if any of the panellists um, had looked at that report and thought about um, whether or not it's a practical move forward. I mean, uh, Des Gupta actually said that GDP was an appalling way of measuring anything and actually said... Um, uh, uh, it means the world economy has deployed, um, um, has de deployed and used e uh, biodiversity for what is routinely celebrated as economic growth, whereas actually, of course, it isn't. It's environmental destruction. Yeah, so I think, you know, on the one hand, the Descripta report was a really big uh, moment for, for those of us who have thought for a long time about the importance of nature and biodiversity to the climate crisis. I think for a long time it's taken or sort of played second fiddle to, to climate politics, which um, it shouldn't. It's just as important to, you know, securing a habitable future. But at the same time, I have significant concerns about significant concerns about the sort of framing of biodiversity and nature in the terms of natural capital and ecosystem services, which means, you know, a river is valuable insofar as it can provide water to economic activity. Um, and part of that comes down to, you know, serious questions about how these values would be defined. So, you know, my personal favorite example is that the IMF, um, some researchers there came up with um, an estimated value for a uh, blue whale. And they decided that based on the revenues from ecotourism, as well as the carbon sequestration that a whale conducts when it sort of lives, sequesters carbon, dies and sinks to the sea floor, it'd be worth about 2 million pounds or 2 million US dollars, sorry, over its lifetime. And these are the kinds of um, situations that we're in where we're fixating all of this um, energy into defining sort of monetary values for something that cannot, you know, its complexity is such that, you know, these cost valuations can't really be done in a way that's meaningful, that I think it's a bit of a distraction. But the other is that, you know, we have a situation where um, there's sort of a landmark report published to inform how um, governments around the world should consider in financing biodiversity um, or sort of restoration and nature restoration. And it was endorsed by, you know, all your heavy hitters from Mark Carney to Christine Lena Georgieva. And the report effectively endorses rather than sort of a regulatory approach and rather than, you know, public investment uh, to patiently sort of restore nature, um, they sort of advocated financial innovation. So securitization, basically the same kind of mechanisms that underlay a lot of the investments um, that were at the heart of the 2008 financial crisis. So sec a securitization to crowd in private finance, public de-risking of private finance. So basically socializing the risks of this investment while allowing investors to privatize the returns and all of these kind of mechanisms um, are sort of enabled by the thinking that uh, underlies the Descripta report. And I think we need sort of a much more, um, a much less market-based approach to understand uh, how we should approach nature. You know, markets are very good at some things. Um, but I don't necessarily think that this will be one of them. And I worry about it sort of being actively uh, counterproductive uh, in, in our quest to sort of preserve the little nature that we have remaining. 
Thanks. I've got two questions from the um, from the chat actually, which I'll which I'll just put because we're beginning to run out of time. There's quite, there's quite a, a tough one from Tony Cook who says, "How do we avoid industry lobbying for projects that claim to be transitional but aren't?" Which I think is a really good question. You, we're often told things will just be, you know, they're, they're for the transition, and then how do you make sure that they genuinely are? And then there was a question about green bonds. Say, someone from um, Anna Beria saying. Uh, sorry, Anne Berry is saying many members of the public would be willing to invest in green projects for a guaranteed return no higher than current savings returns. We know that the Chancellor's announced green saving bonds. How should they be structured and what role could they play? Yeah, so I think um, I'll, I'll go to the green bonds question first. Um, so I think uh, these absolutely will play an important, uh, an important role in allowing people to sort of Put their own savings to to this transition, but I think um, there have been problems um, in sort of green bond markets to date about um, doing exactly what the first question asks, which is, um, is this a green bond that is a bond issued by a green company, or is it you know a green bond that maybe um, the sort of public could issue that will then channel funds into green projects, or is it a bond that commits a company um, like a steel company to transitional activities. So the, the main question uh, or the main issue that's been had with both green bonds and with exactly what the first question asks, which is, you know, how do we actually assure this is full sort of beginning to end transparency in where that money goes. So you can't have a company issue a green bond and then somewhere down the line, they point to a project that may or may not have already you know, been happening or been underway. We need sort of clear front to end transparency in how that money is used um, at all levels of this. And I think for transition companies, um, that will be hugely important because one of the sort of big gaps in the EU taxonomy, for example, is that transition activities are currently defined as those activities or you know that will be necessary to the transition tra transition sorry or enabling activities so those that enable transition activities to occur but there's no um sort of conditionality on actually changing those companies that are in those categories to then meet the net zero sort of thresholds and so that absolutely needs to be a base requirement of green bond issuance lovely um and the transition or was that the last bit? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think I kind of did them together. Oh, so I think, you know, for those companies, there has to be clear sort of targets that yeah. they meet. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, those thresholds need to be met rather than just kind of saying that you fit in the transition category here, have some transition funds and away you go. Um, and I think, yeah, disciplining that will be will be very important. But again, often, you know, the public sector is potentially you know, much better at doing that than the private sector. There's a degree of patience, there's a lower sort of cost implication. And so it comes down a lot of the time, I think, to checking um, the kind of ideological aversion to public investment that often uh, sort of plagues these kinds of, of public investment bodies. Thank you so much. Uh, we have been so blessed with our speakers. We could listen to all of you and, and Heather and, and everyone else for so long, but we're coming to the end of our, of our period. So I'll hand back to Clive to, uh, to have some concluding remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Carolina. I think we may actually finish just about on time if I don't drone on too long, so I'll, I'll crack on. Um, first of all, thank you to all our experts for their time discipline, first of all, but also their thoughtful contributions that they've made today. Just to check those who are still here, we can get back to you if we have further questions, I hope, because there, there may be um, from, so from us and some of our researchers, if that's okay. Um, I think the need to rebuild the economy after COVID in a way that addresses the climate and nature crises at something approaching the scale and speed the science tells us is necessary and how we might ensure that this is also fair and contributes to leveling up the nation remains the overreaching, overarching challenge of our times. It will determine our future and define our legacies. The speed at which multiple vaccines were developed and are being rolled out shows what we are capable of, capable of where the political will exist. Although I would add that there are also dangers that we can learn um, from how the vaccine rollout hasn't been rolled out in, a, in an equitable way for all parts of uh, the planet. But there will be no vaccine against destruction of nature and runaway climate change. But if we seize this moment, uh, we can only set ourselves on a path to meeting our Paris commitments. We can also reverse inequality and the damage done by a decade of destructive austerity. The UK Infrastructure Bank is a litmus test for our ability to meet that challenge 
and our ability to direct private and public finance where it's needed. And that will determine quite simply whether we will build a society that is greener, fairer, and where nature thrives, or we continue on our current destructive pathway. As we've heard today, we can build back better, but building back better needs deeds, not words. The vision, the capacity, and the public desire exist, and we need to harness that and to put it to work. And we here at the APPG will be doing all that we can to make sure that happens. So thank you to our speakers today for your time, for your, uh, for your input, and for all that you do to make sure uh, that this time we really do build back better. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much.